it's time to start so we are now in the year 1913 and there is Niels Bohr a Danish physicist I think we are going to start the class now So Rutherford had this planetary model of the atom. Ab 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 Z multiplied by E where Z is the atomic number and you had electrons going around the nucleus in orbits and the problem is that since the electron is moving in a circle it has to accelerate because its velocity is constantly changing so the electron will radiate energy and would finally collapse into the nucleus so this was one of the problems of Rutherford's model and Rutherford himself could not resolve this anomaly it was a problem for Rutherford as well. But in the 1900, start of the 1900, the quantum theory was born. And around 1913, Bohr came up with an explanation of how this anomaly could be resolved, how this problem could be addressed. And he made a very bold assumption. And he made what is called a postulate. He presented a postulate. In the times of Bohr, it was a postulate because it could not be derived from anything simpler. It was just a statement. And that statement, when applied, gave the correct results. It resulted in the stability of the atom. But these postulates at the time of Bohr could not be derived from anything simpler. So one of the postulates that Bohr presented was that electrons revolve. Look at this word revolve. Revolve around the nucleus in circular orbits. Postulates ka matlab assumptions nahi hai. Assumption is something that you know is incorrect. But for the purposes of simplicity, you say that all right, we're going to ignore this effect. That's what an assumption is. But this is not an assumption. Bohr gave a postulate. Postulate means an axiom. For example, F equals MA is a postulate. F equals MA cannot be derived from anything simpler. It's a basic law of motion. It's a postulate. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. This is a postulate. You cannot prove it from anything simpler. So postulate is not an assumption. Okay? It's a statement. It's an idea which cannot be proved from anything simpler. So Bohr made this very bold statement. It's a postulate because it cannot be derived. However, when you apply this postulate to real physical systems like the hydrogen atom, it gives you the correct results and the atom is stable. Okay? Later when Schrodinger came, he gave a unified picture and these postulates no longer remain postulates. They can be derived. Right? Or they come out of an equation. But this statement does not come out of any equation. That's why it's called a postulate. In Urdu it's called a kulia. It's a kulia. So electrons revolve around the nucleus in circular orbits. Note the use of this word revolve. Revolve means moving. Later we will notice that if we apply the correct quantum theory, there is no such thing as moving of a nucleus. There is no such thing as revolving of a nucleus. But 
Bohr was in 1913 and these postulates form the old quantum theory generally called the old quantum theory <coughs> so these are circular orbits and the second postulate that Bohr presented was in an orbit the electron has a constant energy so what this means is if I have the nucleus plus ZE is the charge on the nucleus and I have an electron in one orbit its energy is going to be something suppose that energy is E1 and when the electron keeps on moving in this orbit, its energy remains constant. Now classically this is not allowed because the electron is revolving, it must be accelerating and hence it must be radiating energy. This is how electromagnetic waves are produced. An oscillating charge acts like a dipole, it gives off energy. So its energy must go down because it is constantly giving off energy. However, Bohr's postulate, it's a bold statement, he cannot prove it uh, from anything simpler. The postulate is very bold because it says that if the electron remains in this orbit, its energy remains constant. If the electron is in another orbit and it's revolving in the other orbit, its energy remains constant and so on. So there are precise orbits of the electron around the nucleus just like planets have precise orbits around the sun the third postulate is if a transition takes place between orbits energy can be absorbed or emitted and that energy is given by the difference of the energies of the two orbits and this energy is emitted as a photon of frequency omega okay. something that we've already seen this concept quantized levels whenever a transition takes place energy is absorbed or emitted so photons had already been discovered when we discuss radiation in the next lectures we'll discuss about photons in more detail the fourth postulate that Bohr presented was that the angular momentum of an electron is quantized so the energies are quantized because the energy is fixed in one orbit and the angular momentum is quantized and if we have an electron that is moving with a velocity v at a radius r what's the angular momentum going to be? mvr so mvr is the angular momentum of an electron v is its speed r is its radius the radius of the orbit and this is quantized and it's quantized according to n h bar does everyone know what h bar is is h over 2 pi n is an integer all right that goes from in Bohr's model n goes from 1 2 3 and so on so the angular momentum is quantized so depending upon what radius the electron is at and what speed is it moving with only allowed combinations only uh, precise combinations of V and R and M are possible M is fixed so V and R are related because this product has to be equal to H bar 2 H bar 3 H bar 4 H bar and so on so this is these are the Bohr's postulates so now let's look at 
how was Bohr able to come up with these postulates and what strengths do these postulates have and what are the implications of these postulates implications ka matlab samajhte hain results thik hai in postulates se kya natije nikalte hain thik hai aur ye kyun important hai dekho abhi quantum theory paida ho rahi hai yaad rakho aap is samajh lo nayi nayi duniya bani hai aur ye bilkul ibtedai dinon ki baatein hain जब फिजिक्स में एक रेवोल्यूशन आ चुका था 1900 के करीब और ये इब्तदाई दिनों की बातें हैं कि क्वांटम थ्योरी डेवलप हो रही है तो ये नए आइडियाज है अब ये आइडियाज भी सुपर सीड हो गए हैं वी हैव स्ट्रॉगर मैथमेटिकल पिक्चर्स स्पेशली शूडिंगर पिक्चर बट दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू अंडरस्टैंड वॉट गोइंग ऑन एट इन द माइंड ऑफ बोहर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी वुड लाइक टू C1 major implication is that the radius of the electron is quantized so which means that the orbits only precise values of the orbits are possible the orbit cannot have an arbitrary radius it can only have precise values of the radius so we know from bohr's model is that the angular momentum is quantized mvr is nh bar <laughs> which means that the radius is nh bar over mv but we don't know what v is m is a constant h bar is a constant we don't know what v is ji So is this before uh, particle wave duality? It's roughly before particle wave duality. Yeah. Particle wave duality came out as a result of this condition. We we'll learn about this in detail. So this is the radius, and this is quantized. But we have to prove that it is quantized. For this, we have to somehow get rid of this velocity. So Bohr's model was a combination of classical physics and modern physics. Uh, what was modern about it the velocity is quant uh, the radius is quantized the energy is quantized when the electron is in an orbit its energy does not change that's a new approach that's a bold approach what's classical about it is that when this electron is moving in a circle there is a centripetal force fc that is pointing towards the center of the circle and this centripetal force f c of course is given by m v squared over r and there must be some agency that provides this centripetal force can you tell me what the agency is it's the electrostatic attraction between the electron and the nucleus and this is just the coulomb interaction so you have to apply coulomb's law to find out what this force is the coulomb's law is k one charge is ze the other charge is e we are talking about the magnitude here over r squared so mv square over r is given by this expression which means that r squared over k z e squared equals r over m v squared which also means that v squared equals <coughs> k z e squared m r is that correct so from here you can find out what you can put the value of v into this equation so if i take the square of both sides here r square is n square h bar square over m square v square i have this equation and i have this equation 
So what I would like to do, I would like to put the value of v square into this equation so that I can eliminate the speed. So r square turns out to be n square h bar squared m v squared which is k z e squared m r m's cancel out this r goes away R square is N square H bar square M square right okay sorry so I have N square H bar square K Z M E square right and we know what the value of K is K is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught do you know what epsilon naught is? It's the permittivity of free space. So our R turns out to be n square h bar squared 4 pi epsilon naught z m e squared. Z is the atomic number, the number of protons inside the nucleus. And if we have hydrogen, Z equals 1, the radius is n squared h bar squared 4 pi epsilon naught m e squared. So this is the radius. Is it quantized? Yes, it is quantized. Everything is a constant here. H bar, pi, epsilon naught, m, e, all of them are constants. So this r is in fact dependent on this number n. And this is an integer. It goes from 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. So only precise values of r are allowed. So I can write a small n as well with it. Because n is the index. So what I now have is if I have n on this axis, I have integral values of n starting from 1, 2, 3, 4 and if I plot the radius here for n equals 1 I get a certain radius and that radius will be equal to this expression right and this expression is denoted as a naught it's called the Bohr radius and its value is about 0.53 angstroms. Do you know what angstrom is? It's 10 to minus 10 meters or 0.1 nanometers. So for z equals 1, I have a naught here. For z equals 2, what do I have? What's the radius for the next orbit? It's 4 a naught. This is 4 a naught. And what about n equals 3? It's 9a0. And so on. So what I really have is I have a nucleus at the center. And the electrons are in circular orbits. This is the n equals 1 orbit. It's at a radius of a0. Then you have the next orbit. The next orbit has a radius of 4a0. And then you have another orbit. And this orbit has a radius of 9a0. And then you have another orbit. And its radius is going to be 16a0. And so on. So the orbits are getting further and further apart. Close to the nucleus they are closer together and away from the nucleus they're getting further and further apart and this is how the radius is quantized this is a very important quantity it's called the Bohr radius and these orbits the n equals 1 orbit is generally called the k shell this is called the l shell m shell n shell 
so bohr's model is basically the grafting of a new concept a new postulate which is almost quantum to the old classical theory it's a combination right because you're using classical mechanics uh, to derive the electrostatic interaction you, which is providing the centripetal force but what's the bold concept here what's new about this concept the energy is quantized, the energy is quantized which means that the radius. radius is going to be quantized now we have to look at the quantization of the energies how energies are quantized inside the bohr's model <laughs> So the electron is being treated as a particle. You see, everything so far is being treated as a particle. The nucleus is a particle, the electron is a particle. And in these three lectures, we are discovering matter to be of the particulate kind. It's all particles that are making up matter. Now, if you have an electron which is close to a nucleus which is positively charged, there is going to be kinetic energy and potential energy. So the energy is going to be the sum of the kinetic energy and a potential energy. Now this energy is the internal energy. We're not talking about the center of mass motion of the atom. Okay? And then we will the energy levels which we have in the lectures. We will understand that in the same way. Now you see, we have a kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy is given by half m v squared. Right, and we know what the value of V is. V is given by that expression. So it's half m V squared is this. I take z equals to one e square four pi epsilon naught m r. And what is r? R is 1 over n, r is n square a naught. Do you follow this? I can write this as 1 over n squared e squared 8 pi epsilon naught a naught. Are you with me on this? Why not? K is half mv squared. What is v squared? v squared is given by this expression. What is r? r is given by this expression. n square a naught. So I just put in the value of v squared from the top. v squared is Z is 1, E squared K is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught M into R. R is M square A naught. So this is my kinetic energy. Is it quantized? Yes. The kinetic energy is quantized. Now let's talk about the potential energy. Now could you tell me what the potential energy is going to be? Because we've already looked at it in one of our classes. <laughs> The electrostatic potential energy of the electron. Minus with a minus sign. <coughs> so the potential energy is going to be minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught e squared over r. And R is given by n squared 4 pi epsilon naught a naught. Thank you. 
Does everyone know how, how I get this? अगर नहीं पता बता देता हूँ कोई बात नहीं बता दू चूंकि किसी ने मुझे कहा ही नहीं बता दू पोटेंशियल एनर्जी वी नो दैट देर इज अ रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन द पोटेंशियल एनर्जी एंड द फोर्स जरा तवज्जो से सुने आई हैव द राइट टू अलाउ यू टू एनी पर्सन टू टेक अ क्वेज और नॉट टू टेक अ क्वेज डू यू रिमेम्बर दिस रिलेशनशिप Yes. So, force is the gradient of the potential energy. Now, the potential energy will be the integral of the force. So, if the force is given by the electrostatic interaction, one over four pi epsilon naught e squared over r squared, and I would like to find out what the potential energy at a particular point r is. what i would do i would take the integral from infinity to r put the force in here e squared 4 pi epsilon not r square and integrate and what this physically means is that i have a nucleus of charge plus e and away at a point r i would like to find out what the potential energy is going to be so i would take a test charge at infinity and slowly move it close to this points i move it into the field i bring it here so it comes from infinity to r and i in during the path i integrate the force so this is how i obtain this expression now i have the kinetic energy and i have the potential energy first of all on your notebooks could you please plot v with respect to n v with respect to n assume this is some constant i would like you to plot the potential energy curve v with respect to n <clears throat> all right first of all could you plot v with respect to r don't worry about v with respect to n plot v with respect to r forget about the other question plot b as a function of r humne pehle bhi ye dekha jab hum internal energy padh rahe the electron energy levels ke bare mein hum padh rahe the it's next we realize that v is always negative and it's inversely proportional to r when r is infinity v is zero and when r is zero the potential energy is minus infinity so i would have a hyperbolic curve like this
This is my potential energy versus R for an electron inside a Bohr atom close to a nucleus. This is the how the potential energy varies with R. But R is the radius from the center. So is the situation spherically symmetric? Which means if I can see an electron at a, I'm a nucleus, I see an electron at a radius R, I can turn in any direction and the electron can be at any radius. That means its radius is going to be the same. The electron is going to be at the same distance with respect to me, but in any direction, right? The direction could be anything. It could be, I could move in this plane and see an electron at a distance r. I could move like this and see an electron at a distance r, right? I can move at any point and away from me at a distance r, I will see an electron, right? So this is what is called spherical symmetry. Spherically symmetric situation. Which means if I would like to plot this potential energy diagram in three dimensions, I can actually make something like this. And this is like a well. Right? So it's three dimensional. It's like a whirlpool. Bhamvar ki tarah hai. Bhamvar hota na three dimensions mein. Bilkul usi tarah ki cheez hai. It's a whirlpool. So this is the potential energy curve. And the potential energies are quantized according to 1 over n square. The kinetic energies are quantized according to 1 over n square. Can you tell me what the total energy is going to be? Can you find an expression for the total energy? Please add the potential and the kinetic energies. Minus? Over 2R. When you add these quantities, you get minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Kuch aur bhi aata hai, n squared bhi aata hai. Aur kya aata hai? A naught. Now, is this energy quantized? It is? No, I have added the potential energy and the kinetic energy. The I get 8, 8 here. Alright, you have to multiply 4. Chalo, koi Could any one student please tell me what the answer is? 8 pi A naught. 8 pi A naught. Epsilon naught. Epsilon naught. And at the numerator, uh, it says uh, E squared on the numerator. E squared, right. Is this correct? Yes. Alright. So this is the energy. This is the electron charge. A naught is the Bohr radius. It's a constant. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. Now, the quantization is... E is proportional to minus 1 over n squared, which means E is given by a quantum number n. So I can write a small n here. Now on this potential energy curve, I have quantized energy levels. And those quantized energy levels for n equals 1, let's call this constant E naught. So my energy E n is given by minus E naught over n squared. So what is the smallest value of energy that is possible? Minus E naught. That corresponds to n equals 1. So my smallest energy level is here. 
this is just minus e naught the next higher level so here the radius is a naught this is the first orbit it's also called the k shell so in the k shell the radius is the Bohr radius exactly equal to the Bohr radius the energy is given by minus e naught and if you find the value of e naught it's going to be 13.6 electron volts so this is how you get the ground state of the hydrogen atom now the next shell the l shell will have n equals 2 so it will correspond to another energy level the higher energy level it will have n equals 2 it's called the l shell and r will be equal to what's the value of r here 4 a naught and the value of energy minus e naught by 4 so as we proceed in energies we get energy levels that get closer and closer together very close energy levels till I reach this point where all the energy levels they coalesce and above this there's a continuum so the radius is going quadratically it's increasing as you go away from the radius and it's increasing quadratically the energy levels are decreasing quadratically the spacings are decreasing quadratically and all of this is coming from the Bohr's atomic theory now if you notice here this is the potential energy curve for the electron inside an atom that we wrote in the earlier lectures that we drew in the early lectures right so we have a potential well like this and the energy levels are quantized so whenever an electron is inside an atom its energy is quantized in this fashion and the second thing is that whenever a transition takes place whenever a transition takes place a photon is emitted corresponding to the difference between these energy levels now how did how was Bohr inspired by this idea this is something very important and something that must be realized yahan tak samajh aage koi kisi ko koi sawal dekho energy total energy quantized hai so the energy can only be this value or this value or this value or this value but the potential energy curve is drawn in a continuous fashion but the energy of course is always one of these values theek hai this is spring on oscillator the parabolic curve banate and the energies are somewhere on that parabolic curve <coughs> ji so what does permittivity tell us what does permittivity tell us if you have two charges plus q1 and plus q2 and you put them at a distance of d there's a force acting between the charges that is given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught the product of these charges and the square of the distance this is the coulomb's law but if you place these charges in say water or air or nitrogen or in a different medium the force <coughs> decreases so instead of epsilon naught you will have the force in the presence of a medium will be given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught some relative factor some relative permittivity q1 q2 d squared so the force goes down because this number is greater than 1 so this epsilon naught is a fundamental constant of nature this relative permittivity is multiplied with the with this uh, permittivity of uh, vacuum to give you the relative uh, to give you the overall permittivity but this is a constant of nature that tells you if you have two charges separated by one meter and each one of them is one coulomb what the force is going to be okay so speed of light 
is related to epsilon naught and mu naught which is the permeability of free space through this expression and this is a constant so these two have to be a constant as well so this is the significance of epsilon naught acha bohar ko kis cheez ne inspire kiya tha i have to finish i'll go on a little bit theek hai तवज्जो से बात सुनो लेट मी फिनिश प्लीज बोर वॉज इंस्पायर्ड बाई स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी एंड वी नो दैट स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी हैज बीन आउट देयर फॉर से हंड्रेड ईयर्स इवन बिफोर बोर्स टाइम सो ही वॉज लुकिंग एट दिस पीपल हैव लुक एट दिस सन लाइक बामर लाइमन एंड वेन द रेडिएशन फ्रॉम द सन इज डिस्पर्स बाय अ प्रिजम वन ऑप्टेन्स दिस line spectrum we've already seen this line spectrum actually we've seen a demonstration of this we seen these discrete lines so if we're talking about the lyman series which happens to be in the visible range this wavelength turns out to be 656 nanometers and this wavelength turns out to be like 350 nanometers so one obtains a line spectrum and what bohr observed in fact lyman observed that if he were to calculate the wavelengths measure the wavelengths of each of these lines they obey a pattern right they obey a pattern and the wavelength lyman was able to come up with a formula which could tell you what the wavelength is and his formula was lambda is the wavelength equal some constant c n squared divided by n squared minus 4 so he just looked at the spectrum measured the wavelengths and he was trying to come up with a formula like solving a jigsaw puzzle that could tell what the pattern of the wavelengths is and he came up with this formula ठीक है इट्स लाइक न्यूमरोलॉजी यू आर सीइंग अ पैटर्न एंड यू वुड लाइक टू टेक आउट सम न्यूमेरिकल वैल्यूज फ्रॉम इट यू वुड लाइक टू गिव मीनिंग टू दैट पैटर्न सो लाइमन वाज ट्राइंग टू गिव मैथमेटिकल मीनिंग टू द पैटर्न एंड ही केम अप विद दिस फार्मूला इट्स लाइक इल्मुल आदाद यू हैव अ नंबर फॉर ईच लेटर अलिफ इज 1 बे इज 2 जीम इज 3 दाल इज 4 and so on so this is he performed a similar kind of exercise he looked at the spectrum this was visually observed and he came up with this formula if n equals now n has to be equal to 3 4 5 6 and so on so if n equals 4 oh if n equals 3 sorry If n equals three, you put three here. Nine over nine minus four. Nine over five into c is some constant. You get this wavelength. You put n equals four. You get sixteen over twelve into c. You get this wavelength, and so on. So he was looking at this spectrum, and he came up with this formula just empirically. Now, if you look at this formula, Bohr had this formula in front of him. and if you do a slight readjustment of this formula bohr was able to make sense of his model and how was that possible dekho you are reading into the minds of these great scientists and it's not one scientist who works alone every giant in science stands on the shoulders of some other giant so bohr was standing on the shoulders of lyman and einstein Einstein was standing on the shoulders of Maxwell. Maxwell was standing on the shoulders of Newton. So you're reading into the minds of these great physicists. Now let's look at this formula. If we rearrange this formula a little bit, don't be restless. I know it's exciting. If you look at this formula a little bit, you have one over lambda, one over c, 
n squared minus 4 over n squared. One over c, one over lambda is one over c, n squared minus four over n squared. Okay, let me just check if I've written this formula correctly. Right, n squared minus four. Okay. <laughs> So in Bohr's model, let's look at the Bohr's model. You have two energy levels. This is n equals 2. This is some other n. So your lower shell is the L shell. And whenever a transition takes place from a higher energy level, from the nth energy level to the energy level with, with the quantum number n equals 2, the energy gap is given by E. What's the energy in this level? It's minus E naught over N squared. What's the energy in this level? You have another minus with minus E naught over 4. So this becomes E naught 1 over 4 minus 1 over N squared. This is the energy gap between these levels, right? Delta E. Now, whenever this transition takes place, a photon will be emitted. And that photon will have a wavelength lambda. And this energy gap is going to be equal to Hc over lambda. Agreed? So, this delta E is in fact equal to Hc over lambda. So if I take this expression and I move back to this blackboard, one over lambda equals E naught over HC into 4N squared N squared minus 4. This is E naught over 4HC N squared minus 4 over n squared. Now is this formula identical to this formula? Are the two identical? Yes, they are completely identical. So this was Lyman's formula. Sorry, Balmer's formula. Balmer's formula. I'm sorry for that. It's Balmer's formula. Because in the Balmer transition, the transition ends at the L shell at the n equals 2 shell. So this is Balmer's formula derived from a completely empirical means. Empirical ka matlab samajhte hain? Empirical ka matlab samajhte hain? Empirical ka matlab hota hai observation se jo cheez nazar aari ho. Thik hai? Analytical nahi hai, wo observation se nazar aati hai. Experiment se nazar aati hai. So this was Balmer's empirical formula. And if we apply Bohr's model, you get exactly the same formula so you can tell what the value of c is going to be so the two formulas are identical so Bohr's model makes complete sense and it explains experimental results so the summary for the Bohr's model is that Bohr made this astounding leap of imagination 
that when an electron is inside an atom and it's seeing the attractive pull of a nucleus, it moves around in orbits. The energies of these orbits of the electrons when in orbits is quantized and the radius is also quantized. So from tomorrow what we're going to do, what we have seen so far is matter has a particulate existence. Tomorrow we're going to see radiation and we're going to see radiation has a wave-like existence. So before we depart there's going to be a small test. So please be seated while we distribute the questions and please don't please don't start until everyone has a question paper please don't do that